How many people are in the room? That was the first thing Stella asked me as she settled in at the table. I looked around the diner. It was two in the morning. The place was mostly empty. What do you mean? How many people are in here right now, besides us? She said. Maybe five, six, I replied. Stella's lips trembled. How many people are in the room exactly? She was terrified. I counted. The waiter, the old man staring into a bowl of soup by the door, the two young women coming down from a night of partying over pancakes, the guy in a ball cap trying to cut through his overcooked steak, and the middle-aged woman in a pea green overcoat. Six, I said. Six people Stella instantly relaxed. Thank you, Stella, and I hadn't seen each other in five months. Stella instantly relaxed. Thank you. Stella and I hadn't seen each other in five months. I was in school out of state and was home for the summer. Stella had gotten into a good university, but her sister, Anne, had died in a car wreck two weeks before she went off to school. The death hit her hard, real hard. I wasn't sure why she'd called me. I doubted it was to catch up and it certainly wasn't to party. Stella knew I abstained from everything. For me, that decision was the end result of being raised by verbally abusive alcoholics and knowing the genetic odds. Stella looked rough, not strung out, but existentially exhausted. There were scars on her hands, bruises modeling her tattooed forearms, and some unusual scarification marks on her neck. Two of them, they looked like clumsy ZS, but reversed as if done in a mirror. Stella's friend Corey had dropped her off at the diner about 30 minutes before I'd gotten there. I didn't know him well, but what I did know, I didn't know I didn't like. So how are you holding up, I asked. Stella didn't answer. The waiter appeared and Stella looked him over cautiously before she ordered a black coffee and a slice of blueberry pie. I got a hot tea and a side of fries, though I wasn't exactly hungry. We sat in uncomfortable silence for a few minutes before Stella, staring down at her hands, asked, What's the worst thing you ever did? I shrugged, said, lied to people. Lied to get out of things, mostly to my friends in high school. But I've changed. I don't do that anymore. Oh, I also shoplifted once. A pair of socks, Stella laughed. That's when the waiter reappeared with our drinks and food. Stella jumped, her eyes wide, face flushed. The other people in the diner turned and looked but did nothing. Are you all right? The waiter asked, weirded out. Taking a deep breath, Stella slowly sat back down. Yeah, sorry, she said. I just, just, it's been a long night. The waiter shook his head as he put the stuff down. When he left, Stella sipped her coffee and then she looked over the mug at me, her eyes tearing. I did the worst thing you can do. I tried to kill someone. I wasn't sure I heard her correctly. What? Stella nodded eyes locked on mine. A jogger. Corey and me hit him with the car. Oh my God. When did this? On my way here. The blood drained from my face. We should call the cops. He could still be there, hurt and... Don't bother. She interrupted. We went back and checked on him. There was no jogger. What's that fucking mean? I was starting to lose it. Please don't start playing games with me, I said. I don't want to hear this sort of bullshit. Isn't bullshit. Stella replied. Ask Corey. I didn't want to call Corey. Stella said. I didn't actually see the jogger. Corey did. That's how I knew. So I asked him exactly where the man was and I grabbed the wheel and Corey screamed at me as I made the car slam into the guy. Sent him flying like it mattered. Corey hit the brakes hard. He was losing it, talking about going to prison and his life being over. But I told him not to worry. 
that pissed him off something bad. When he something bad, when he got out of the car to go help the jogger, he just froze up because there was no one there. Road was empty. Me, I expected that. She took another sip of coffee and poked at the slice of pie with her fork, stabbing the crust and examining the blue tinged tines in the dull fluorescent light. See, it can look just like a person, could be any age, dressed any sort of way. It talks like a person, eats, drinks, does all the regular sorts of things people do. Doesn't exactly sound threatening, I know, but wait for the twist, I can't see it. This thing pretending to be a person, it's invisible to me. But you, you and everyone else, you can see it. I don't know what you're talking about. And I didn't. Stella finally looked up at me. Two weeks ago, we were tripping. Me and Corey and this woman named Genevieve. She was the guide. This was at Corey's house on the deck. We dropped N-bomb, that synthetic MDMA stuff. We'd been using hallucinogens and trying to explore an inner mental space. Tripping together, d sharing the same imagery. It's crazy how, if you're in sync, like emotionally and mentally, you can basically travel together. I know how it sounds I do, but it was really working for us. We were. I'd guess you'd describe it something like astral traveling. We built this architecture, this city, in our minds and then explored it. Mostly it was made of shifting, beautiful buildings. Structures that rose over us like mountain ranges. And uh, in this mental city, that's where we came across it. The diner door chimed as the two young women having pancakes left. Stella watched them go, then turned back to me. I didn't need an explanation. There are four people in here now, I said. She nodded, sipped more coffee, and then continued. Well, this night we traveled deeper into the city than we'd ever been before. We ended up in a tower, had a spiral staircase. We all went up to the top floor and found a locked door. You're all seeing the same thing. I interrupted, not buying the experience. Yes. Stella's demeanor had intensified. The twitchiness melted away. We all saw it. Okay. So we get to this door, it's a metal door, dented but from the inside, bulging out like someone was kicking the door, trying to smash it down. Genevieve, she got scared, told us to not open that door, to stay far away from it. She said a Voyager was on the other side. Voyager? That's what Genevieve called it. Being a guide, she knew the sort of constructions we were exploring. She'd seen doors like this one, and she'd been warned about the Voyagers. The way she told it, they were like us, explorers in inner space, but not from our reality, from another one, a bad one. But long story short, I opened the door. Why would you do that? Stella stirred her coffee, lost in thought for a second. As she did, one of the cooks quietly came out from the kitchen and sat at the counter. He flicked through a newspaper someone had left and glanced over at me. He nodded, gave a little smile. I wondered if he'd made the fries I wasn't eating. After Corey and Genevieve drifted away, Stella continued, still staring at her drink. I heard a voice on the other side of the door, my sister's voice. She was begging, pleading with me to let her out. I swear it was her. So I opened that metal door. Feeling the stare of the cook, I ate a few of the fries. They were cold, soggy. What happened? I asked Stella. When I opened it, something suddenly brushed past me. Something clammy, cold. It touched me, very briefly. There was pain. Stella unconsciously motioned to the Z-scars on her neck, then continued. Anyway, there wasn't a room on the other side of the door. Just a void. A deep emptiness. When the trip was over, I immediately felt a change. I felt like I was being watched. The whole rest of that night, the next day, the next week, something was following me. A shadow. A presence. And I knew, I just deep in my gut knew, that if it caught up with me, if it touched me again, I would die. 
She kept stabbing at her slice of pie, breaking the crust, letting the congealed blueberries slowly tumble out in a little landslide of jelly. You told me that you can't see this thing, Stella. The door to the diner opened and two men in work overalls walked in, each holding a hard hat, their clothes dusty. Stella suddenly straightened in her chair. Two men just walked into the diner, right? I nodded. Yeah, just those two guys. Stella settled. Why me? I asked. Why did you want to meet? To tell me this? Stella smiled. First time she'd done that all night. Because I knew you'd believe me. I swallowed hard, my throat suddenly, and possibly dry. You've been a good friend. Stella blinked away, welling emotion. In high school, when things got bad, with. With boyfriends or assholes, you were the one I could confide in. The one that trusted me. The one that trusted me. The one that no matter what I did, no matter how stupid it was, you were there for me. A shoulder to cry on, a hand to hold. And she reached across the table and took my hand, squeezed it, tight. Truth was, I'd had a crush on Stella most of high school. She was a friend for sure, and for a while a good friend. I liked being that rock for her, but I'd always hoped for more. Like most friendships, it began with a one-sided attraction, mine. And even though I hadn't seen her in half a year, those feelings remained, dormant but there, waiting to be awakened. As Stella held my hand and smiled, I noticed, I felt, her fingernail tracing something on the inside of my palm. At first sight, just a little pressure. Only it got sharper until, ouch, shit. I pulled my hand away to find Stella had cut me. She had sliced a shape with her sharp pinky nail into my skin. It was a backward letter Z, like the ones on her neck. A ribbon of blood began to well up from the center of the small cut. What the hell, Stella? She just shook her head and stood up, backing away from the table, repeating over and over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to, okay? I had to. Had to what? Hurt me. I was furious, confused. Everyone in the diner turned to watch us. Only the cook got up from his place at the counter and walked over, eager to lend a hand. I waved him away. It's okay. I got it under control. That was when Stella broke, her voice barely a whisper. What? I told him I got it. She went pale. Who? Who'd you tell? The cook. I yelled. He's just trying to help you. There is no cook. No one's there. Stella began shrieking, scrambling backward. She slammed into a nearby table. Chairs fell over. Silverware scattered. No, no. She yelled. No one's there. The cook kneeled down beside Stella and for a split second, bewildered as I was, I honestly thought he was going to help her up. He didn't. Someone screamed. I think it was the woman in the pea green overcoat. And now, the Voyager, whatever it is, has come for me. It's been five days since Stella died in that diner. It didn't work, and now she's doomed me. Right now, I'm in my bedroom at my parents' house, how many people are in here right now? How many exactly? Every night, no matter the weather, something walks down our street whistling softly. You can only hear it if you're in the living room or the kitchen when they walk by and it always starts at exactly 3.03. The sound starts faint somewhere near the beginning of the lane near the Carson place. We're towards the middle of the street, so the whistling moves past us before fading away in the direction of the cul-de-sac. 
When I was younger, my sister and I would sneak into the kitchen some nights to listen. Mom and Dad didn't like that and we'd catch hell if they found us out there, but they were never too hard on us since we always stuck to the one big rule. Don't try to look at whatever was whistling. My neighborhood is a funny place. I've lived here since I was six and I love it. The houses are small but well kept, good sized yards, plenty of places to roam. There are a lot of other kids here my age. I turned 13 back in October. We grew up together and would always play four square in the cul-de-sac or roam around from back porch to back porch in the summer. This was a good place to grow up. I'm old enough to see it. And there's only the two strange things here the night whistling and the good luck. The whistling never bothered me much. Like I said, I couldn't even hear it from my bedroom, but mom and dad don't like talking about it. So I've stopped asking questions. My dad is a strong guy, tall and calm. He has an accent since he moved to the US as a kid. His family, my grandparents, they're from the islands. That's what they call it. My dad, the only time he isn't so calm is if the whistler comes up. He talks a little quicker then, eyes move faster, and he tells us not to think about it so much and to always remember the one rule. The big rule, don't try to look outside when the whistler goes past. Not that we could look even if we wanted. See, there are shutters on the inside of every window thick pieces of heavy canvas that pull down from the top and latch to the bottom of the window frame. Each latch even has a small lock, about the size of what you'd find on a diary. My dad locks those shutters every night before we all go to bed and keeps the key in his room. My mom. I don't know what she thinks about the whistling. I've seen her out in the living room before at 30303. When the sound starts, I could see her if I cracked my door open just an inch to peek. She's not out there often, at least I haven't caught her much, but once or twice a month I think she sits out there on our big red couch just listening. The whistler has the same tune every night. It's cheerful. Da 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 dum Da 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 dum Remember how I said there are two odd things about where I live? Well, besides our night whistler, everyone in my neighborhood is really lucky. It's hard to explain and Dad doesn't like us talking about this part much, either, but good things just seem to happen to people around here a lot. Usually it's small things, winning a radio contest or getting an unexpected promotion at work or finding some arrowheads buried in the yard, you know, the authentic kind. The weather is pretty good and there's no crime and everybody's gardens bloom extra bright in the fall. A million little blessings. We moved into our house here to be closer to the hospital. As soon as we moved here, Nola started getting better. The doctors couldn't figure it out they chalked it up to whatever they were doing, but we all could tell they were confused. But my parents knew, even I knew, Nola getting better was just another of the million little blessings we got for living in our neighborhood. So that's why we stayed even after we found out that, for every small miracle that happens here every day, now and then dot 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 some bad things happen. But they only happen if you look for the whistler. See, our neighborhood has a welcoming committee. They show up with macaroni casserole, and a gift basket and a manila folder whenever someone new moves in. They're very friendly. Four people showed up when we moved in seven years ago. The committee made small talk, gave me a Snickers bar, and took turns holding Nola. It was her first week out of the hospital, so they were extra careful. Then the committee asked to speak to my parents in private, so I was sent to my room where I still managed to hear nearly every word. The welcoming committee told my parents about how nice the neighborhood was, really exceptionally, hard to explain kind of nice. And then they told my parents about the even harder to explain whistling that happened every morning at 3.03 and ended at the tick of 3.05. The group, our new neighbors, warned my parents that the whistling was quiet, would never harm or hurt us, as long as we didn't look for what was making the sound. This part they stressed and I pushed my ear into the door straining to hear them. People who went looking for the whistler had their luck change, sometimes tragically. A black cloud would hang over anyone that looked. Anything that could go wrong would. The manila envelope the committee brought over contained newspaper clippings, stories about car crashes and ruined lives, public deaths and freak accidents. Not everyone dies, I heard the head of the committee tell my dad. But the life goes out of EM. Even if they live, there's no light in them ever again, no presence. My mom, I could tell she wasn't taking it seriously. She kept asking if this was some prank they play on new neighbors. At one point, my mom got angry, accused the committee of trying to scare us out of our new home, asked them if they were racist on account of my dad being from the islands. 
My dad calmed her down, told her he could tell our new neighbors were sincere, and they were just trying to help us. He explained that he grew up hearing these kinds of stories from his mom, and that he knew there were strange things that walked among us. Some of those strange things were good and some were bad, but most were just different. After the committee left, dad went out to the hardware store, bought the canvas blinds, the latches, and the locks and installed them on every window in the house after dinner. That first night in our new house, I crept out of my room at 3 a.m., only to find my dad awake sitting on the living room couch, holding my baby sister. My dad held up his finger in a shage motion but patted the couch next to him. I sat and we waited. At exactly 3.03 we heard the whistling. Da 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 dum da 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 dum It came and it went just like our neighbor said. The whistling returns each night and we never look and we enjoy our million little blessings every day. Nola breathes on her own and she's grown into a strong, clever girl. My dad even joined the welcoming committee. We don't get new neighbors often. Why would anyone want to leave? But when a new family moves in, my dad and the committee bring the macaroni casserole, a gift basket, and the manila folder. I can always tell by the look on my dad's face when he comes back if the family took the committee seriously or if we'd be getting new neighbors again very soon. Not long ago, a family moved in directly next to us. The previous owner, MS, Maddie, passed away at age 105. She'd lived a good, long life. Our new neighbors seemed like they'd fit in just fine. They believed the welcoming committee, took my dad's advice about the locking shutters since they had a young child of their own. Whatever newspaper clippings were in that manila envelope, whatever evidence my dad never let us see. But I imagine it must have been awfully convincing since our neighbors got along with no issues for the first month. One night, when our new neighbors had to leave town, they sent their son, Holden, to stay with us. He was 12, a year under me in school. I didn't know him well before that night, but as soon as his parents dropped him off after dinner, I could tell it was going to be a bad time. Do you know who is always out there whistling every night? Holden asked the moment the adults left the room. The three of us were sitting in the den, some Disney movie playing idly on the television. My sister and I exchanged a glance. We don't talk about that, I said. I think it's that weirdo that lives in the big yellow house on the corner. Holden said. Mr. Tolls. My sister asked. No way, he's really nice. Holden shrugged. Must be a psycho killer, then. Nola tensed. We don't talk about it, I repeated. Let's go in my room and play Nintendo. We spent the next few hours playing games, eating popcorn, and then watching movies. A typical sleepover, but I could see Holden was getting antsy. After my parents had wished us a good night, locked the blinds, and gone to bed, Holden stood up from his beanbag and walked over to where Nola and I were sitting on my bed. Have you ever even tried looking? He asked. It's nearly time. Like most sleepovers, we'd conveniently ignored any suggestion of a bedtime. I was shocked to see he was right. It was almost 3 a.m. I sighed. We don't. See, I can't, I can't even try to look because my dad locks the blinds every night and hides the key. He continued, ignoring me. So does our dad, said Nola. No, replied Holden. No, he doesn't. You saw him do it, I said, a little sharper than I meant to sound. Holden grinned. Your dad locks the blinds. Yeah, but he doesn't hide the key. He keeps it right on his normal keychain. So I asked, worried I already knew what he would say next, because I had noticed that my dad didn't bother hiding the key anymore after all of these years, because he knew we took it seriously. So after your dad locked up, but before your parents went to bed, I went to the bathroom, and on my way, I may have peeked into their room, and I may have seen your dad's keychain on his nightstand, and I maybe went and borrowed the key to blinds. Nola and I stared and his grin only grew wider. You're lying, I said. Holden shrugged. You can check if you want. Just open your parents' door and look. You'll see his keychain right there on the nightstand. Stay here, I told both of them. Don't move a muscle. I hurried over to my parents' room but hesitated at the door. If Holden wasn't lying, dot 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 my dad would be angry. Beyond angry, I was scared thinking about it. 
but more scared of an open window with the whistler right outside. I opened the door barely an inch and looked in, but it was too dark to see. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the room. Two steps into the dark, I froze. The whistling started, and I could hear it clearly dot, 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 dot from my parents' room. I never realized, but they must have heard the sound every night since we moved into the house. They never told us. I don't think I could have slept through it. I stood there, listening to the whistling come closer, unsure whether I should turn on a light or call out for my dad. Soft sounds from the living room brought me back to reality. Nola, I yelled, running out of my parents' room. Holden and Nola were standing near the front door next to a window. Holden wasn't lying. I could see him fumbling with the lock on one of the blinds. I heard a click. He did have the key. Holden let out a quick laugh. Nola stood next to him, hunched up, afraid but maybe curious. The whistling was right outside our house now. I think I made a sound called out. I can't remember. Time felt frozen, clock hands nailed to the face. But I found myself moving. I'm not fast, I've never been athletic. Somehow though, I covered the space between myself and Nola in a moment. My eyes were locked on her, but I heard Holden pull the blind all the way down so it could release. I heard the snap of it start to raise, and I heard the whistling just on the other side of the window. But I had my arms around Nola and I turned us so she was facing away from the window. At the same time, I jammed my eyes shut. The blind whipped open. The whistling stopped. I felt Nola shaking in my arms. Don't look, okay, I told her. Don't turn around. We were positioned so that she was facing back towards the hallway and I was facing the window. My eyes were still closed. I felt her nod into my shoulder. I reached out with the arm not holding Nola and tried to touch Holden. My hand brushed against his arm. He was shaking worse than Nola. Holden, I asked. Silence. I reached past him and gingerly felt for the window, eyes still sealed shut. The glass was cold against my fingertips, colder than it should have been for the time of year. I moved my hand up the window, searching for the string to the blind. The glass began to get warmer the further I reached and there was a gentle hum feeding back into my fingertips. I tried not to think about what might be on the other side of the window. Finally, I touched the string and yanked the blind shut. I opened my eyes. In the dim light leaking out from the kitchen, I could make out Holden, pale and small, staring at the now closed window. Holden, I asked again. He turned towards me and he screamed. Everything became a flurry of motion. Light sparked to life in the hall, then the living room. My parents' footsteps thudded across the hardwood floor. I didn't turn to look back at them. My eyes were glued to Holden. He was pale, had bit his lips so hard there was a thin red line of blood running down his chin and he'd wet himself. What happened? My dad asked from behind me. I managed to swivel away from Holden and look back. He looked. I'd never seen my dad scared before, but I saw it that night. In that moment, an old, ugly terror stitched on his face. A parent's fear. Just Holden. He mouthed to me. I nodded yes. My dad let out a breath. He looked so relieved I nearly expected him to cheer. But then he turned to Holden and my dad's face changed. I wondered if he felt bad for feeling good that Holden was the only one that looked. There was a knock at the door. We all froze. Holden whimpered. Don't answer it, my mom said. She stood at the threshold of the hall. I'd always thought she was a skeptic and just humored my dad about the windows and the whistler, but that night we were all believers. I noticed that both of my parents held baseball bats they must have taken from their bedroom. The knock came again, a little louder this time. Please don't open the door, Holden whispered. My dad walked over to him, hugged him close. We won't. My dad promised, still holding his bat. Nothing is coming in here tonight. Thud, thud, thud. This time the knocking was loud enough to rattle the door. Holden screamed again and Nola clutched her arms around my neck. My mom came over and knelt down next to us, wrapping my sister and me close. Thud, thud, thud. Call the police. My mom whispered to my dad. The knocking instantly stopped. My dad looked over his shoulder at us. Do you think? He was cut off by frantic knocking that trailed off to a polite tap, tap, tap. 
police. Something said from the other side of the door. The voice from outside sounded exactly like my mom, like a parrot repeating the words back to her. Police, call. The police. Tap, tap, tap. Police. My mom pulled us closer. Police, 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 police. Please stop. I heard her whisper. I don't think calling them will help. My dad said. How will we know when they're the ones at the door? The knocking came back harder than before. The door shook. Then it stopped. After a long moment, I heard the knocking again, but it was coming from our back door. We all turned together towards the back door, but the knocking immediately returned to the front door. Front to back, back to front, loud then quiet, then loud again. Suddenly, the sound was coming from both doors at once, big, heavy blows like a sledgehammer. Then something started rapping against all of the windows in the house, then the walls. It was like we were living inside a drum with a dozen people trying to play at once. Or we were a turtle, and something was attempting to claw us out of our shell. Stop. Holden yelled. The knocking died. I won't tell. Holden said, staring at the door. I promise I won't tell anyone what I saw. Just please go away. We waited for nearly a minute. Then we heard it, a soft tap, tap, tap coming from the window Holden had looked through earlier. Holden started to cry, sobbing like a prisoner watching gallows being built outside their cell. My dad held him, brushed his hair but never lied to him, never told him things would be okay. The tapping at the window went on for the rest of the night. We huddled together in the living room for I don't know how long. Eventually, my mom tried to take his kids into my room while my dad stayed to watch the door. But the second we moved into my bedroom, the knocking came back, so loud it was possible to ignore. I was afraid the door couldn't take it. We went back to the living room, and the knocking stopped. Only the tap, tap, tap on the window remained. None of us slept that night. The tapping stopped around 7 a.m. That's about the time the sun comes up here. We waited another two hours before my dad opened the blinds from one window. He made us all go back to my parents' bedroom first. I heard him open the door, then come back in. Okay, he told us. It's done. Holden's parents came back around lunchtime. My mom and dad walked Holden over to his house, and they all went inside for quite a while. Nola and I watched from the window. She stuck to me the whole day, right at my side, sometimes holding my hand. When my parents came back, they looked grim but wouldn't tell us what they said to Holden's family. It was a Sunday, so we all spent the day together, ordered pizza, and watched movies. That night, everyone slept in my room, Nola and my mom in the bed with me, my dad in a chair he'd pulled over. There was no knocking that night or any night since. We didn't see much of Holden or his parents for the rest of that week, but by Thursday, there was a moving truck in their driveway. Nola and I watched them packing up the whole afternoon after school. What sticks with me most is how tired Holden and his parents looked. All three had the same pallor, grim mouths and lightless eyes. Even from across the street, I could tell something was very wrong. Holden and his family were gone before sunset. I remember what the original welcoming committee said to my parents when we moved in. Not everyone who looks at the Whistler dies, but even those that live have the light go out of them and the rest of their lives are full of misfortune. A million little tragedies. I think Holden's parents must have looked, either to comfort him if they didn't believe or share the burden if they did. I watch Nola some days happy and young and alive, and I wonder if I'd been slower. If she'd looked out the window that night dot 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 dot, would I have looked too? To comfort her? To share that burden? I'm glad I don't have to find out. We still live in that house, in that neighborhood. We still hear our whistler walking past every night. The blessings, the luck, the good things here are too good to leave. But we're careful. We don't have friends over to spend the night anymore. And my dad hides the key to the blinds very, very well. Not that I've gone looking. Some things you just don't need to look for. It's official, I'm an old man. For the last couple years I've comforted myself by saying I'm in my early 70s, but math is simple and unforgiving. Today is my 75th birthday, and God, the years do fly. I'm not here for your well wishes. This is hardly a milestone I'm excited about. 
I'm glad to still be here, of course, but I find I have less and less to live for with every passing year. My bones ache, my kids live far away, and the other side of my bed has been empty for just over eight months now. In fact, once I cast my vote against that goddamn Trump this November, I may have nothing to live for at all. So spare me your happy birthdays and your congratulations, if you please. I'm here because I have a story for you, and it's one I've never told before. I used to think I kept it inside because it was silly, or maybe because nobody would believe it. I've found, though, that the older you grow, the more exhausting it becomes to lie to yourself. If I'm being perfectly honest, I've never told anybody this story because it scares me almost to death. But death seems friendlier than it used to, so listen close. The year was 1950, the setting a small town in Maine. I was a boy of nine, rather small for my age, with only one friend in the world to speak of, and his family, seemingly on a whim, decided to move 2,000 miles away. It was shaping up to be the worst summer of my life. My pop wasn't around and my mom was a chore whore boy. Was I proud of myself when I came up with that one so I wasn't apt to hang around the house? With some hesitation, I decided the public library was the place to be that summer. The library's collection of books, particularly children's books, was meager to say the least. But within the walls of that miserly structure, I would find no undone chores, no nagging mother God rest her soul, and perhaps most importantly, no other children with whom I would be expected to associate. I was the only kid with a low enough social status to spend his precious days of freedom sulking amid the bookshelves, and that was just fine with me. The first half of my summer was even more dreadful than I had imagined it would be. I would sleep in until 10, do my chores, and then ride my bike to the library, and by bike I mean rusty log of shit attached to a pair of wheels. Once there, I would split my time between unintentionally annoying the elderly patrons and deliberately doing so. One pleasant lady actually interrupted my incessant tongue clicking to hiss a shut the fuck up at me the first time I ever heard a grown-up use the F word. Big fucking deal, I know, but in those days it was unheard of. The dreary days turned to woeful weeks. I had actually begun praying for school to start again until I discovered the basement. I could have sworn I'd roamed every inch of that library, but one day in the far corner behind the foreign language collection I stumbled across a small wooden door I had never seen before. That was where it all began. The door was windowless and made from oak that looked far older than the wall in which it rested. It had a knob of black metal that quite literally looked ancient. I wouldn't have been surprised to learn it was crafted in the 17th century. Engraved on the knob was what appeared to be a single footprint. I had the sense that whatever lay beyond this door was forbidden to me, and therefore probably the most interesting thing I would encounter all summer. I quickly glanced around to make sure nobody was watching me, then turned the heavy knob, slipped behind the door, and shut it. There was nothing, only darkness. I took a couple of steps and then stopped, unnerved by the totality of the shadow which surrounded me. I waved my hands in front of me in an attempt to find a wall or a shelf or anything to hold hold on to. What I actually found was far more subtle a small string dangling from above, but far more useful. I grabbed it firmly and pulled it down. Back in the day, lots of light bulbs were operated with strings, and this was one of them. My surroundings were instantly illuminated. I was standing on a small, dusty platform that looked as though it hadn't seen life in quite some time. To my left was a crickety-ass spiral staircase made of wood and appearing ready to collapse at any second. The bulb was the only source of light in the room and it was feeble, so when I peered over the railing to see what lay below, the bottom of the staircase dissolved into the darkness. I was beginning to feel scared. This place wherever I was seemed to have no business in a town library. It was as though I were in a completely different building. But no nine-year-old likes to let a mystery go unsolved. Looking back, I wish I could tell my prepubescent self to turn around, go back, do anything else besides descending that staircase. You'll be spared a lot of sleepless nights, I'd say. But of course, I didn't know that then, and I may not have listened, even if I had. So instead of turning back, I took a deep breath, gripped the railing, and glared resolutely forward as I began my descent. The wood on the railing was dry and covered with splinters. I immediately let go, holding my hands out for balance as I carefully traversed the staircase. It was, or at least seemed very long, and with only the dim glow from the string bulb far above me, my heart pounded mercilessly in the darkness. 
Even kids can sense when something isn't right. I think they just don't always give a shit. By the time my feet reached the cement floor at the bottom, the light from the bulb above was very nearly a memory. But there was a new light source, and God, I'll never forget it. Directly in front of me was a door, massive and a deep shade of red. The light was coming from behind the door, and it shone out in thin lines from all four sides a sinister, dimly glowing rectangle. For the second time, I took a deep breath and went through a door I shouldn't have. In contrast to the dank room I entered from, the room behind the door was blinding. When my eyes adjusted, what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was a library, the most perfect library imaginable. I gaped in wonder as I stepped, almost reverently, further into the room. It was beautiful. It was smaller than the library above, much smaller, but it seemed to be almost tailor-made for me. The shelves were packed with brightly colored titles. Both armchairs in the middle of the room were exquisitely comfortable. And the smell, my God, the smell was simply unbelievable. Sort of a mixture of citrus and pine. I simply can't do it justice with words, so I'll suffice it to say that I've never smelled anything better. Not in my 75 years. What was this room? Why had I never heard of it before? Why was nobody else here? Those were the questions I should have been asking. But I was intoxicated. As I gazed around at all the books and basked in the smell of paradise, I could only form one thought I will never be bored again. In truth, boredom only hid from me for three years. It was on my twelfth birthday, sixty-three years ago to this day, that everything changed. Before that day, I visited my basement sanctuary as often as I could usually several times a week. I never saw another soul down there, yet strangely remained free of suspicion. I never removed a book from that room, but instead would pick up a particular volume wherever I had stopped reading during my previous visit. I sat, always in the same deep purple armchair, and always leaving its twin barren and directly across from myself. That armchair was mine, the other was, well, I suppose I couldn't have articulated it then much better than I can now. But it wasn't mine, that's for damn sure. On my twelfth birthday, I arrived later than usual. My mom had invited a couple classmates and some cousins over to our house to celebrate, a gesture which I found more tedious than touching, really, I just wanted to spend my birthday sitting and reading and smelling paradise. Eventually, our guests went home, and I made it to the library about 15 minutes before closing time. That didn't matter, the workers never checked down there before they locked up. I was free to stay as late as I wished. This particular night, I was devouring the final chapters of an epic adventure night, swords, dragons, and the like. I didn't smell it until I read the final words and closed the book. The once exquisite aroma of that room had turned sour. I sat for a moment unsettled. Objectively, I could recognize that the smell was actually the same as it had been before that mixture of citrus and pine. I just perceived it differently and I didn't like it anymore. It was the nasal version of an optical illusion, you know, the one that looks like a young woman glancing backward, but all of a sudden you see that it's really an old woman facing toward you. You can't unsee that, and I couldn't unsmell this. The spell was broken. The odor also seemed, for the first time, to be coming from somewhere specific. With a fair amount of trepidation, I stalked around the room, sniffing the air like a crazed canine until I came to a shelf near the back. The shelf was perfectly normal with the exception of one title a large, leather-bound cover of solid faded maroon with one striking black footprint at the top of the spine. This was the source of the smell. I opened the front cover and saw one sentence scrawled neatly in blood-red ink atop the first page. Rest your sorrows down, friend, and leave them where they lie. I stared at this sentence, mesmerized as I began to retreat to my chair. I turned a page, blank. The smell became stronger. Another page blank and the smell grew stronger still. I stopped for a moment, suppressed a gag and continued walking. Then as I neared the armchairs, I turned one final page and there, in the same sinister print, was the last thing I expected to see my own name. I dropped the book. I began to sprint toward the door, but as I shifted my gaze forward, my heart leapt to my throat and I stopped in my tracks. The empty chair wasn't empty anymore. An aged man in a suit sat before me, one leg crossed over the other, contemplating me with piercing gray eyes and a light smirk. This was all too much. I fell to my knees and expelled the contents of my stomach onto the carpet. 
I wiped my mouth, staring at my vomit, when I heard the man let out a chuckle. I stared at him disbelievingly. Who are you, I asked, panic in my voice. The man leapt to his feet, grabbed me gently by the shoulders, and helped me to my chair. He sat once again in his own. I fear we got off to a bad start, he said, glancing at the pile of sick on the carpet. The smell. It does take some getting used to. Who are you, I repeated. Tonight you will know hardship like you've never before known, he said. I come as a friend, offering you refuge from it, and from all other storms which lie ahead. I wanted nothing more than to leave at that moment, but I remained seated. I asked him what he was talking about. Your mother is dead, my boy, by her own hand in her kitchen. The scene is gruesome, I must admit, he said in sorrowful tones, but was there a playful glint in his eye? Surely you wish to avoid this path. I can show you a safer one. My blood ran cold at the horrors this man spoke of, but I did not believe him. What do you want with me, I demanded, trying to sound braver than I felt. He laughed, an old raspy yelp that seemed to shake him to his bones. Nothing but your friendship, dear boy. He said, then sensing I found his answer inadequate, he expounded. I want you to come on a journey with me. My work is noble, and you will make a fine apprentice. And maybe, when I'm done. He sighed tiredly, running his bony fingers through his thin white hair. Maybe then my work can be yours. I stood up, shuffling toward the door, but never breaking his gaze. You're crazy, I told him. My mom isn't dead. She's not. See for yourself, if you must. He said, gesturing toward the door. I threw him a contemptuous glare and bolted for the exit. As my hand closed around the knob, he said my name softly. In spite of myself, I turned around. Your road won't be easy, friend. If it ever becomes too much for you, and I mean ever. He said, pausing to sweep his hand over the room. You know where to find me. I slammed the door behind me and took the decrepit stairs two at a time. I exited the library, clambered onto my bike, and hightailed it home. The front door was wide open. I dismounted, leaving my bike in a heap on the ground, and approached the house cautiously. The old man was lying, he must have been. Still, tears began to sting my eyes. Heart pounding, I stepped inside and called for my mother. I heard no answer, so I turned into the kitchen. To this day, I don't know why she did it. I've lived in that small town in Maine my entire life, although I've kept mostly clear of the public library. Once in my late twenties, I summoned the courage to step inside. Life was good at that time, and my fear had begun to morph into idle curiosity. Where the door to my basement sanctuary once stood was only a blank wall. I asked the librarian what had become of that basement, though in my heart I knew the answer. There was no basement, she said. There had never been a basement. In fact, if she had her facts correctly, city zoning ordinances prohibited a basement in the area. I've been haunted by that sickly sweet smell, that poisonous blend of citrus and pine, ever since that long ago birthday. When I saw my mother in the kitchen that day collapsed in a pool of her own blood, I smelled it. When a man claiming to be my father knocked on my college apartment door, begged me for money and beat me to within an inch of my life when I refused, I smelled it. When my wife miscarried our second child, I smelled it. And again when she miscarried our fourth. When our oldest son got behind the wheel of the family Buick completely shit-faced and got his girlfriend killed, I smelled it. I began to smell it periodically as my wife became sick. She died late last year and now I'm alone for the first time in more than half a century. Now I smell it every day and it feels like an invitation. A few months ago I went back to the library and the small oak door with the ancient handle was there right where it used to be. My evening walk has brought me past that library every day since, but I haven't gone inside. Maybe tonight I will. I'm frightened to die, yes, but lately I'm even more frightened to keep living. The old man was right my road hasn't been easy, and I doubt it will get any easier. Rest your sorrows down, friend, and leave them where they lie. He promised relief. A refuge, he said. Was he right about that, too? 
There's only one way to find out. After all, I still know where to find him. His Tinder profile said he was 45, but he looked to be in his early 30s at most. Looking for a sugar baby, $700 weekly, no sex. It sounded too good to be true, but as a broke university student, I was willing to take my chances. I swiped right and Tinder let me know it was a match. His message came seconds later. Hey there, sweetheart. I cringed at that word. I hated it, but $700 was $700. So I sucked it up and replied, Hey! His name was Jack, and he told me he owned his own business, although he never specified what kind of business it was. We talked for a while before he asked me for my Venmo to send me the first payment. You still there? I clicked on the message. Yeah. Sorry. If you don't mind me asking, what are you looking for in return? I stared at the chat until he replied. I'm just looking for you to do a few favors for me. That sounded like it was going to be sexual to me. Like what? For example, the first thing I need you to do is pick up a delivery for me. That sounded innocent enough, but I was still expecting there to be some kind of twist. $700 to pick up a package? Come on, even I wasn't that naive. From the post office or something? No, I'll send you the address, but I'd rather not do this through Tinder. You got kick, or you can give me your number. Kick? What was this, 2011? I decided to give him my number instead, and he texted me the address immediately, followed by the address to his house, where I would have to drop off the package. I'm not home right now but there's a key on the bottom of the blue flower pot near the door. Go inside and put the package on the coffee table in the living room. Make sure that you lock the door when you go inside the house, and then lock it again when you leave. Got it. On my way. My phone buzzed as I backed out of my driveway. I'm serious. Lock the door both times, please. I thought that was a little excessive, but I promised him that I would. The house looked abandoned. It had a broken chain link fence around it with a small door that was hanging on to dear life. It stuck out like a sore thumb, surrounded by houses that were a lot nicer than this one in comparison. You here for Jack's shit. I looked up to see a man standing in the open doorway of the house. He took up almost the entire space, his head skimming the top of the doorframe. He was huge in height and muscles and his entire torso was covered in tattoos. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess. I replied, not moving from my spot on the sidewalk. Stay right there, he said. I did. I actually don't think I would have moved if he had asked me to. I looked around and realized that there was no one else on this street. I was a 21-year-old woman alone in the street. I gripped my car keys. A few minutes later, the man came back out carrying a cardboard box. It was about the size of a shoebox, but stained and damp on some of the corners. Can you open your car? He asked. I opened the trunk, not wanting that inside on my car seats, and he set it in. All right, there you go. He said. Thanks, I replied. I walked around to the driver's side of the car and opened the door. Oh, and one more thing. He said. I looked at him. Watch out. He said. I didn't reply. I blasted my music as I drove to Jack's house, hoping it would drown out my anxiety. It didn't. I parked my car in the stone driveway and stayed inside the car, admiring the house. It was a huge house with stone pillars on the front porch and the greenest grass I had ever seen in my life. I turned the car off and got out. I grabbed the package and walked to the front door, getting the key from where he said it would be. I opened the door and stepped in, closing it behind me. I thought about what he had said, about locking the door when I got inside. I thought that was a little overboard, but as I stared at the closed door something made me reach out and lock it. 
I walked inside, my feet cushioned by the thick maroon carpet, and admired the inside of the house. All the furniture was wooden and looked incredibly expensive. I would probably finish school a dozen times with the money that it took to furnish this place. I set the package down on the coffee table, and as I walked back to the door, I heard a phone ringing from somewhere inside the house. I froze. In my pocket, my phone buzzed. I took it out to look. Don't answer any calls that aren't from Marvin. I put my phone back and followed the sound of the phone, poking my head into a few different rooms before I found it in an office. I walked over to the desk and looked at the caller ID. Incoming call from Jack. That was odd. I grabbed my phone to look at the message again. I was starting to get a little bit creeped out and decided I wouldn't answer, just to be safe, and left the house, remembering to lock the door as I left. I've done a few more favors for Jack since then. I drove a BMW to a random park in another city, only to get out and drive a different car back to Jack's house. He had me meet one of his employees at lunch, who then gave me a briefcase to deliver to the first house I had gone to and told me he would know if I looked inside. On several occasions, he asked me to drive down to that same house and stay with the guy, whose name was Julio for a certain amount of time. In total, I've made around $3,500. Most recently, Jack asked me to stay in his house overnight. I woke up to a text message from him. I need you to spend the night at my house. I hadn't ever seen him in person, but I had talked to him on the phone a few times. He proceeded to tell me he would pay me $1,000 to spend the night at his house, provided that I followed a few rules. I drove to his house that evening. The driveway was empty and it normally was, but the porch light was on. I walked up, unlocked the door, went inside and then locked it again. Everything in the house looked the same. Jack had told me over the phone that he would leave the list of rules on the dining room table. I set all my stuff down in the living room. My bags looked like garbage compared to the fancy furniture in there. I wandered into the kitchen and then to the dining room. Sure enough, there was a piece of paper on the wooden table, held down by an empty glass. Lock the door when you come in. Only answer calls from Marvin. Don't turn on any faucets between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. Don't open the door for anyone, no matter who they say they are after 10 p.m. If the door to the closet at the end of the hall is open, sleep in the library. If closed, sleep in any of the bedrooms. The gardener comes at midnight. If he starts knocking on the windows, hide. Turn the TV on and let it play on static through the night. Do not forget to do this. Help yourself to anything in the fridge. I'll pay you in the morning. Good night. I made sure to follow all the rules. To be honest, I was regretting my decision. But seeing as I was already here and I was getting paid, I decided to stay anyway. I figured as long as I followed all the rules, I'd be perfectly fine. Still, it felt a little odd. What was this? A haunted house. Nevertheless, I lounged around the house for a few hours, as I was planning on going to sleep around 9 since that's the time that all the weird shit would begin to happen. At 8.50, I brushed my teeth, using the faucet for the last time before 9. I had dozed off at some point because, at exactly 10.16 p.m., I was woken up by the doorbell ringing. I was about to get up to check, but then I remembered the rule. Don't open the door for anyone, no matter who they say they are after 10 p.m. I stayed on the couch, trying not to move, paranoid that they would hear even the slightest sound. It's the police. Open up. I didn't move. Hello? It's the police. Open up or we're coming in. I still didn't move, but I could hear my heart beat in my ears. There was silence for a while after that. Then the doorbell rang again. Hey, it's Jack. Let me in. It sounded like Jack, but still, I didn't get up. He would have a key, wouldn't he? Why would he need me to let him in? This continued for almost a full hour. Different people would ring the doorbell, announce themselves, 
and then disappear when I didn't respond. I was finally able to fall asleep, and the gardener never came. When I woke up the next morning, I heard someone in the kitchen. I got up slowly and unlocked the door as quietly as possible, taking my phone with me and walking across the living room and into the kitchen. I stopped at the entrance and peered in. It was Jack. He was standing in front of the stove, stirring something as the coffee machine brewed coffee on the counter behind him. Hey, good morning. He said when he saw me. Hi, I replied, nervous. I hadn't seen him in person before, but he looked exactly like his pictures online. Scrambled eggs. He asked, motioning to the pan with a wooden spoon. Yeah, thanks, I replied, walking over to take the plate from him. I ate my breakfast and drank some coffee in silence. So how was it? He asked. It was okay. Nothing super freaky happened, I replied. Cool. He replied. There was an awkwardness in the room. I think I'm going to go now. I have class I trailed off. I didn't, but I really wanted to get out of there. Oh no, yeah, sure, I'll talk to you some other time. He replied. I grabbed my stuff and he walked me to my car. I could see him standing in the driveway, staring at me as I left. When I got home, I unpacked all my stuff and noticed that I still had the list with me. I sat on my bed and read it again. I felt my body tense up as I realized that I had forgotten something. Turn the TV on and let it play on static through the night. Do not forget to do this. Turn the TV on and let it play on static through the night. Do not forget to do this. Do not forget to do this. Do not... I stared at the words on the page until they lost meaning. Beside me, my phone buzzed, snapping me back to reality. It was the $1,000 payment. I looked at my phone and then back at the list. Maybe it wasn't an important step? As I was thinking this over, a text from Jack came at. I'm not in town right now. I should be back next week, so you're free from running any more errands for me until then. Just sent the payment. Go do something fun. I stared at the message and read it again. And again. And once more for good measure. I'm not in town right now. I thought back to this morning and how Jack was in his house, how he gave me breakfast. I'm not in town right now. Within minutes, a new text came in this time from a number that I didn't recognize. Did you forget to do something? The text was followed by a picture of Jack or whoever this version of Jack was standing in front of the TV. I didn't respond. Next came another picture. This one was of the outside of my house. It was followed by another text. Watch out. 